Hello and welcome to this video on the economic growth and the development of the Gilded Age. We're going to look at the huge amounts of improvement to the economy of the United States in this period. We're going to explain why it happened and we'll evaluate just what happened to Americans in this period. Whether everybody got rich or was it just the few. Clearly from this overview you can see just the amount of increase that America uh, had in between 1860 and 1900. It grew the GDP which is the total amount that's produced is 4.3 billion in 1860 to 15.2 billion by 1900. That's a per capita increase from $500 to $1,100. You can see that that comes from manufacturing, which grows from 3 billion to $13 billion. Manufacturing is going to be key to the success of this period, and the workforce grows from roughly 13 million to 19 million. In the 1880s, there is an annual growth of 3.8%, a huge increase for such a country, uh, for a country of its size. A very quick overview. In the North, the Civil War really stimulated demand for businesses and industry. There was increased laying of the railroads. The cities in the North grew rapidly. In the, re the West, there was rapid e economic exploitation. It was aided by the Homestead Act of 1862 that we're going to look at. And thousands and millions went West in search of a better life and their own future. The South suffered from the loss and destruction of the Civil War and the end of slavery. The the ports of Charleston, New Orleans, etc., are badly damaged, and in 1860 they start to recover, but it's very, very slow. Agriculture is the biggest loser in this period. We, we talked about manufacturing being such a success. Agriculture, farming, is the big loser. The Homestead Act of 1862 opens up millions of acres of free land, but it meant there is huge amounts of mortgage debts from borrowing money to buy that land. The number of farmers does rise from 10 million to 25 million by 1890. There is increase in large commercial farmers and there's developments in new technology. So let's delve a little bit deeper. The northeast in farming benefited from the expanded markets. Cities became distribution hubs, but they're not the biggest um, agricultural center. The south, King Cotton still ruled. That meant there was still those rich farmers benefiting from cotton but there's a growth of tobacco and other products in this period small farmers are really struggling against large farms it's very uh, lacks profit to be a small farmer and you're struggling in this period you may even go back into becoming indebted and having to work for somebody else there is some development in the new south so ports like mobile Charleston, New Orleans, but it lags very, very far behind the north. And the west is really the growth area for agriculture in this period. The Transcontinental Railway that opens in 1869, uh, the conquest of Native Americans almost entirely by 1877, and then we got the Oklahoma land rush in 1889, where millions move west to Oklahoma. For instance, the population rises from 760,000 to 6 million they go there for their own slice of the pie, for their own piece of the land. And it benefits from steel plows, from railroads, but they are badly damaged by years of drought in 1887, and the farmers in the New South even struggle. Overall, agricultural prices fall in this period. The price of wheat, that's, um, uh, the price of wheat globally changes because of Russia exporting. Farmers rely heavily on the loans, and investment was below. Farming was inefficient. It relied on big farmers to take over small homesteads to create larger farms to be more profitable. Urbanization, cities. Millions moved to cities. By 1900, 40% of the population of America live in cities. In 1860, it's just 20%, so double the amount of people live in cities. New York rises from 1.1 to 2.5 million and they're seeking new markets, new business opportunities and it creates a mobile workforce. This is spurned on by the creation of railroads, it makes transport easier and it becomes places where you can work and get a job. The majority of this influx into cities comes from, you guessed it, immigration and we talked about that earlier when we said about the um, areas of these cities becoming dominated by different immigrant groups. Most of the cities are located in the region east of the Mississippi River and north of the Ohio River. They benefit from new technology. Indu uh, industrialization is the process that happens that really does grow the economy of the United States in this period. We've got the Bessemer Converter. 
there's a huge reduction in the price of steel. It means you can produce steel much more cheaply. That means we can build more railroads, which means we need more steel, which means we produce more steel. There's huge developments in farming equipment, steam tractors, mechanical reaping, and we've just talked about the benefits that agricultural saw due to that. We've got Edison and electricity in this period, and we've got Bell um, and the telephone. Railroads is perhaps the biggest growth sector in industrialization. 53,000 kilometers of new track. We've got the Pullman Palace sleeper cars. You don't have to sit in the back of a wagon anymore. You can get on a Pullman Palace overnight car to travel from one side of the country to the other in relative luxury. And we've got refrigeration cars, and this has a huge impact across America. In the West, we don't have to have cattle drives. We can kill the cows, place them into refrigeration cars, and we can transport them to the East where we can sell them. In terms of milk, etc., 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 all of these products can be safely transported around the country. And it leads us to the growth of robber barons. Robber barons is a derogatory slur used against a number of individuals that control most of the money of the new industrialized America. They are not regulated by government, they are allowed to do what they please, and they get the nasty nickname of robber barons. They do this in many different ways. They control the economy and they control business through trusts. They're formed to avoid laws that try and prevent monopolies. We've got the growth of vertical integration. That's the control of the resource production and distribution of supply. So if Mr. Watkins sets up his uh, orange juice company, Mr. Watkins also buys out the orange producing grows and he's also gonna buy a chain of supermarkets to sell it. I can control the price of orange juice and you're gonna have to pay a hell of a lot more for my orange juice. Monopolies, control of the market. Mr. Watkins buys out all of his orange juice competitors. Nobody else has any choice and you have to buy my orange juice and it's not even that nice, it's got bits in it. There's also cartels, trusts combined to dominate the market. Mr. Watkins' trust of orange juice combines with Mr. Spark's orange juice trust, and we form a cartel. We don't just don't have a monopoly now, we dominate the market, and you cannot buy juice from anywhere else. Mr. Spark starts creating an apple juice store, and you have no choice but to buy Sparks and Watkins juice. And we've got tariffs. The robber barons grow so powerful in this period, Mr. Wat Mr. Watkins and Mr. Sparks grow so powerful, we can persuade government, with a little help of money, to impose tax on imports of other products. You can't even buy foreign-made juice. You have to buy American-grown orange juice and American-grown apple juice. And you can see why they get their term robber barons. Some examples of the robber barons, Cornelius Vanderbilt, perhaps the least interesting of all of them. He consolidates the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad into a huge network. He has a hundred million dollar empire by the time of his death and he hands it over to his son and they together become known as the Railroad Barons. We've got John D. Rockefeller, began Standard Oil in the 1870s. By 1872 we've got something that we call the Cleveland Massacre where he buys up 22 of the 26 main competitors and he creates the Standard Oil Trust of 1882. It grows to be the largest business in America and arguably John D. Rockefeller is the most richest man in America that the world has ever seen at that point. He has uh, an empire that's worth roughly 13 billion in this period and he's the target of the Sherman antitrust laws by 1890. Public, uh, public views of these robber barons is very negative in the 1880s and by 1890 they're putting enough pressure on the government to do something and the government passed the antitrust laws in 1890 that try and break up the power of the trusts and cartels. They're not particularly successful. And lastly, we've got Andrew Carnegie. He creates the US steel business in 1870. He buys out other steel companies. He relies on vertical integration. He controls the natural resources, the coal, and he also owns the he uh, owns the production, he was the man that brought the Bessemer steel converter into America and he owns the methods of distribution as well. And he dominates the steel market and creates trusts and other institutions to protect it. Clearly these men become very, very wealthy but they exploit the workforce to do it. So to summarise, the growth was not continuous, it was very much harmed by the 1873 depression it was not a continuous period of growth. We've got prosperity not being shared. Most of this wealth 
goes in the pockets of a few individuals. Carnegie, Rockefeller, you've got other individuals like Vanderbilt and JP Morgan who owns control of the banks. And we're gonna talk about him in another lesson. We've got boom and bust. Huge periods of boom, huge periods of uh, bust. We've got the panic of 19, 1873. We've got the droughts in agriculture and it leads to tremendous amounts of industrial unrest. We talked about the strikes and the get togethers where people show their distrust of the robber barons and it leads to the progressive movement that we'll talk about in the next series of lectures. And we've got huge amounts of corruption. Corruption, left, right and centre. Corruption of politics, corruption of the businessman and corruption of American dreams. Thank you very much.